Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, what we would like to, what I would like to start with today is to um, ask you a little bit about the uh, midterm, how you found it. How did you find the midterm? Was it unexpected? Was it okay? I thought it was reasonable. Okay. Unexpected. Unexpected. Unexpected for sure. Okay. Which part of it was unexpected? I felt like I knew how to do number two, um, but the first part really threw me through a loop. I just, I couldn't for the life of me remember the equations that were associated uh, with that without certain parts that weren't given. Okay. Um, I will, what, here is what I normally do um, with the midterm. I will, um, take this weekend to grade it. And then um, what I normally do is I will give you the opportunity as a homework to um, do a critique on your solution. What I mean by a critique. And then I will give you extra points for that. All right, I will tell you how many points um, that is gonna get. The critique means that um, you don't necessarily say, oh, I made a mistake. I know that a critique of a paper is like somebody gives you somebody else's work and say, do a critique on this. Usually you go objectively, you don't put emotion in there. You just say, you know, that um, not what you forgot, but maybe the misunderstandings you had. If you forgot something, that's human. You cannot explain why you forgot something. <laughs> People forget all the time and me too. Um, and then people do uh, uh, small mistakes all the time, including everybody, myself and everybody else. So you, you cannot explain small mistakes. At one point, your brain works in a particular way. You cannot, uh, give, uh, you cannot rationalize that. But if there are specific things that you missed in misunderstood, um, then you can analyze it and say, for example, in this particular case, I thought before that this and this happens, but obviously now I understand that this and this happens. And then you write it down and this will give you an opportunity not only to look at the solutions, but also correct and get, of course, a, a bonus points. I mean, that's gonna be not the goal, it's the outcome, but also it's gonna give you a solution to, to correct some misunderstandings that you had about some of the concepts. So I normally do that especially when I see that there is a broad, um, a large number of students who had similar problems. And um, so I will not cover the solution um, today for that reason, obviously. Um, and if I see that only very few students had that, then I can work with the students separately. But if I see that there is, uh, there are specific misunderstandings that I see them everywhere or in any number, in a large number of students, then I will do that. Um, so you can learn from this um, activity. Now, um, the characteristic in this problem was that on one end, it's a geometry, three-dimensional and so forth, the way we see the uh, capacitors. On the other end, you had like a connection to a source that reminds you more of circuits. And um, so that I think what threw you off, is that right? Or am I, am I wrong? Yeah. And I was also expecting like uh, uh, magnetic field questions but it was all electric field and but, capacitance. Yeah, I could only yeah. give one problem for the time, to tell you the truth. And it either had to be a magnetostatics or an electrostatics. You cannot give too much in 50 minutes, practically. And I could not give 
So I can, if I were to give a problem, it could be one or the other with multiple questions. So since electrostatics has been around longer in our minds, all right, I decided to do that. And I did the same thing for the other session too. It was both electrostatic problems. What else was it that um, surprised you, if I may say? I'm not gonna lie, I didn't see the correction that you sent regarding uh, epsilon naught, which is why I was confused at first time sent a negative 12. Ah. So when I was getting like super high capacitor values, I was kind of getting nervous, but. Um, that's okay, if that's the, that I don't consider that to be a problem, especially if it's something that I cause. But other than this, um, the the second question is it like a trick um, that it appears? Uh, it's asking the total capacitance of both of a the the capacitance that is seen between a um, between a b uh, uh, b yes. c. Yeah, is it a trick? Because it looks like it's in series, but when you draw a circuit, actually the equivalence is not a like a capacitor in series. So it's not a trick. It um it it uh, connects um, circuit theory that you know with a geometry that has a capacitance is rather based on the following understanding that a capacitance is like something that a, geom a capacitor always has capacitance, all right? Whether we excite the capacitor with the voltage or whether we don't excite it at all or whether we have, you know, whatever kind of circuit conditions we create, the circuit conditions do not change the capacitance. The capacitance is what it is. What the circuit conditions do is to regulate the current or the voltage, the current that flows through or the voltage that is applied, especially for capacitor, right? The voltage across the capacitor. But the capacitance, as you know, has no relation. I mean, if we, after we calculate the capacitance, all right, you see the capacitance is inherent, is an in, in, inherent property of the geometry. So when you say, when I ask you to go uh, to a, a lab, I don't know whether you had circuits lab. A circuits lab, for example, you go, you have a board, then you put different components, all right? Usually, probably you had that in a circuits class where you did something with op-ups and stuff like that, where you use capacitors quite a bit. So they will ask you to go in and use a capacitor and place it. So capacitors are there by their value. So they are in boxes, all right? So you have a capacitor with so much capacitance, with so much, with so much. Each one of them has been designed to have a capacitance without having a particular voltage. So the capacitance is an inherent thing. And when, uh, and I try to mention that in class that it does not depend on the excitation, but that is a demonstration of where you have a geometry with a capacitance that now when it's connected, when you have more than one capacitors and are connected accordingly, then what you see in the circuit environment, which part of the capacitance, whether you excite it, whether you, any part of it, you know, any value of it is, um, depends then on the excitation. So the, when I ask, when somebody is asking for a capacitance, is asking you to find, when I give you a geometry and say, go and find the capacitance of this, go and, and design me a capacitor, for example. When you design a capacitor, you don't consider what kind of excitation you're gonna give the capacitor. You design it, you design the geometry. But then when I take the capacitor you put in a circuit, how the circuit performs depends and how much current you have or charges you have depends then on the excitation. And so when somebody is asking you for a capacitance, they don't have to tell you how much voltage they will put across the capacitor. But when they ask you for a charge, then the charge depends on the excitation, how you excite it, what kind of voltage you put in there. See what I'm saying? So that's probably the most complex thing in all of this was that you now connect it 
something we learned in this class in electrostatics with the circuit components that you were doing before. Yeah, I remember that, like uh, what we were taught when like back back when we were taking like 214 yes. um, that or, or 208, physics 208, that the uh, capacitance are capacitance uh, is a property instead of uh, yes. Um, like a voltage, it depends on the source. Yes, it is a geometrical property, rather, all right? And it's a mat materials property. So you make a capacitor, it's a ceramic capacitor, you make it, whatever it is, it has these capacitors. When you- Right, yes. yeah. When you I got drawn it, into the formula in, during the exam. I got like confused and uh -huh. I, I knew this before. It's just like during the exam to so that specific I question, I, I just get- um, I, I got, you know, the combination of the two, obviously, is it, it, it was not a trick, it was a complexity, all right, to be able to combine the two. But that uh, they, uh, in any case, as I said, I'm going to check how the class did. And then I will give you, um, as I did with my previous classes, and as a matter of fact, uh, students learn a lot more from that than anything else. Because you know what I said in this class is I'm not using the tests to give you a grade. I will um, assess your learning to give you a grade. That's what I'm trying to do. So I'll give you as many opportunities to learn, and in the process, you know, you can you can improve your grades as well as you learn that. So I I like the idea of giving a midterm and asking the students to analyze to critique their own solutions. And in the process, correct the misunderstandings of stuff. I, I don't want, you know, I was, I, I know how everybody, we are all humans and I know how we feel when we take an exam and I know all of this. What I would like you is to assume that that was somebody else's solution, your solution, somebody else's. And now you're coming as a reviewer and say, oh, this was a mistake. This was a misconception or this was the wrong um formula or with the wrong idea because this is how it has to be for these reasons. That's the kind of analysis I would do on somebody else's work. And by doing that, I think you're gonna, it's like you look at, you critique your own doing and then you learn so much out of this. So in any case, that's what I was, um, I, I'm going to do if I hear that this, and as I, <laughs> I expect it, you know, because otherwise without that, the exam would be like two parallel plate capacitors, all right, which we have done extensively. And I did not want you to derive anything, but I understand that. Okay, that is very useful. And I will look at that, as I said, over the weekend. Anything else that, um, that um, surprised you in all of this? Did you think, let me ask you this, did you think that um, it was, um, it this, this type of thing was um, not appropriate for the kind of material we have covered in the class? Um, please give me your feedback because sometimes, you know, for me, a lot of things are so simple and so obvious that I cannot put myself in your shoes. That's why I'm asking. And your feedback is very important to me. I cannot see the same things the way you see them. That's why I ask you. <laughs> so, um, we, okay, so what I will do I'm, I'm guessing I'm gonna ask you to um, I'm gonna ask you to um, review your own material and analyze it. I mean, and you know, do a critique on your own meter. That's gonna be your homework for next week, and I will do that for the other class too. I gave them there something also, uh, <laughs> and. Um, I will probably show you unless you have seen that, but I will show you um, just briefly of what I will, I plan to do their problem after, you know, after I give it, after I receive back the homework. But what I gave them for a moment, so if you want to see, and I will um, get, just to give you an idea of what I gave the other section. Let me see. Let me 
Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. I will give both solutions to, for, as preparation for the um, meter. So that's what I gave them. It was in the beginning a, um, a structure like a coaxial, but only with one conductor. And then had a row, had a, a, the internal, in place of an internal conductor, I had this charged cylindrical surface, but there was no conductor in its place. So the cylindrical surface. And I asked them, to give me the field in area one, two, and three, assuming that the conductor, the outside conductor was all grounded. So these are the things that we've done. And then um, I ask them to assume that the outside uh, surface of the conductor was not grounded and ask them to find the external field. These are things that we have done in class. So, you know, if, if and if they had to develop it or they could go and copy it. Um, then I ask them to put a conductor, which does not change anything, rather, you know, just to, so I can speak about a capacitance. I put a conductor there in the, cent in the internal area and I ask them to find the capacitance for this, which is a coaxial line. Um, which we have done. And D is the equivalent to some of the things. So it says, what will happen to the capacitance of the coaxial line if the outer surface of the outer conductor is not grounded? Is the capacitance going to increase, decrease, or stay the same, and why? So this is what I wanted to, um, what I gave them practically. So it was like kind of a, not exactly like the same like yours, but it was a different type of a question. And the last one, D, needed some thinking on their end. Because um, we talked about this, but we have not, I don't believe I have given a problem or anything like that. I wanted to see how they will think about it. So this is the problem I gave to the other section. And most probably I will do the same thing with them. So usually I do the same things with each section. If I give to your section that uh, critique, as I said, as homework, and I will do the, the same thing with them for their, for their part. But I will then, after all of this, um, after the homework is submitted, I will post the solutions and I will give the solutions both to you and them. So, um, if you don't have any more questions, then I think I will proceed with um, today and Monday, we are going to just wrap up the magnetostatics and then move on into time varying fields and transmission lines. And so um, if, if it's okay, and unless you have other questions, do you have any more questions before I proceed? Are we going to have any, any assignments due this Sunday or is it going to be next yeah. week? The assignment for this Sunday will be a critique of your own meter. So see what I'm saying? So you would be able to read it before Sunday? and, and I will read it before Sunday. And I will um, upload it. I will read it because I have uh, tomorrow we don't have a class. All right. So tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. I will read the midterms. That's so the, you're going to post it on Sunday and it's going to be due on Sunday the same day? No, I will post okay. it on Sunday. And it's going to do next Sunday. OK, that's, that's what I was asking. Yeah, that is like what homework does. So it's like we treat it like another homework, all right? OK, no. so we don't have anything due this Sunday. No, because this Sunday, I told you we were preparing for the midterm and we don't have anything due this Sunday. OK. All right, thank you. I, I will probably give, however, in addition to the individual, I will give a team homework this Sunday that is gonna do the next Sunday because I have not given a team homework. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, well, will we have a, an office hour this Sunday? Yeah, we will have office hours. Uh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll ask the questions then. Okay, sure. Um, 
yeah, I'm not gonna, of course we have, we don't, Sunday is not a, I mean, Sunday, Sunday is like the only day we have for a week, for a, for a break is this Friday. And then next Friday also, that's why we have a class today. All right, so now I'm proceeding. Let me see, we'll go here, here, here. Okay. Um, what I would like to do in, in today's lecture, and um, then as we move to Monday, I wanted to say a few things. Obviously, the concept of electrostatics, magnetostatics, and time bedding fields is a concept that cannot be covered in one semester. So a lot of times from the lectures we give, you will see that um, some faculty will cover some things depending on how we develop, you know, our understanding as faculty about the importance of different elements. And as I said, in my case, I see everything from a circuit's point of view. This is, this is what I'm doing. So, but I decided as we go through electrostatics, magnetostatics, and then electromagnetics and then time bearing field, especially transmission lines, which is one part of the time bearing, is to create for you a story that goes from electrostatics to capacitances, from magnetostatics to inductances, and then from capacitances and inductors, from capacitors rather, and inductors, to go and use these circuit concepts into the time varying fields. So practically we use electrostatics so we can uh, develop capacitors and understand capacitors and capacitances. Use magnetostatics to understand inductances and, and know how in inductors are, can be designed and then go to time varying fields to understand how electric and magnetic fields, now which are related, are excited. And then go to transmission lines where now we have introduced already the concept of a capacitor. We have introduced already the concept of an inductor. And then we can use LNCs to go and develop the concept of transmission line and then look at what, how we use transmission lines and how we develop different circuits like out of transmission lines. The, the one most important thing we're gonna do is gonna be matching, transmission line matching. And why matching in transmission lines is gonna be important? Because if you go to a higher level class where you talk about receivers, you will see that um, to make a receiver, you need to develop different components. One of the components is a filter. So you need transmission lines to create a filter. Another component is gonna be the low noise amplifier. You need two things to create a low noise amplifier, three things to create a low noise amplifier. You need a, a um, transistor, you need an input matching network and an output matching network. So matching and transmission lines are critical to create a low noise amplifier. You need a mixer, which also, what is a mixer? It's like a local oscillator. A local oscillator is a transistor with matching that makes it perform like this. So practically, these are the three most important components. So practically, we're developing now a, the basis of a story. And the story is on how you proceed from fundamentals to some very complex circuits, all right? So I'm not gonna cover everything. Why am I saying that? There are so many other things that we have not covered in this class. And it's not because, well, it, that I don't consider them important. It's because we don't have enough time to cover everything. And instead of covering here things like here and there, like hop, hop, hop kind of thing, one topic here, another there, I decided to create a story out of this and cover the topics that support the story. So that's a little bit of the philosophy on how to do that. So you should not be surprised if you go to an antenna class and somebody tells you, well, you have not covered plane wave reflection of interfaces. Well, yes, we were not gonna cover it because we don't have time to do that plus anything else. 
So that's I wanted to tell you ahead of time on how this works. Unfortunately, in some other universities, this, this topic is covered with a, not unfortunately, in all universities, these topics are covered over many courses, as you can imagine. But in any ways, in the sequence that I'm teaching is gonna be based on that. So at least you're gonna remember that story. If not knowing everything else, you're gonna remember that. Is there anybody who may have a question about how we are trying to do this class? Or who may wanna share some thoughts about it? Okay. So um, in magnetostatics, we're gonna, the problem we're gonna try to complete is a, how to, we are very close to defining an inductance. And then the next thing we are gonna do today, and the next thing we're gonna do and fi finish it on um, Monday is to talk about an inductance from a coil and to talk about uh, transformers in the most fundamental form. Uh, you're not gonna see many transformers in high frequency circuits. You usually see transformers in um, DC primarily, uh, not well, not in, in low AC, not DC, low AC, and um, where you try to change the voltage from one to another. So that's where you will see rather transformers and, and in some circuits, but not very extensively, they take a lot of space to be done. So um, here, this, um, this table that I have in front of you is very important. So to put things in your, um, to put things in perspective. Um, in electrostatics, we talked about the electric field. All right, we talked about the electric field, the electric flux density, which is related to that. We have not talked about the conduction current, which um, I'm gonna give you Later in, um, in transmission lines, I'm gonna introduce the concept, but in reality, if you have an electric field in a material that has losses, has some kind of conductivity, that's what losses mean. The material has conductivity. So the material has free electrons as opposed to being an ideal dielectric that does not have free electrons. In that case, the material inside is going to have a conduction current, all right? And, and that is what you normally see. The, that's the only current you see in electrostatics. And this conduction current is utilized to develop resistors. So a resistive material has high conductivity or low conductivity, but it has um, so resistivity. And then it, you, that's how you have a current that flowing inside a resistor. Otherwise, um, the, you could not have a current that flows inside the resistor because it's a material that has an electric field and then because it's a, it has a sigma, then it has a J. All right, then epsilon and sigma will be those important quantities. And then here we have seen that. That's the, the, the uh, Gauss's theorem. And of course, we have not talked about the curl of E because that was not important, it's zero but we have seen the divergence theorem, all right? And then of course we have seen that we have the force, the electric force, and in circuit elements, in the form of circuit elements, what is what we see in electrostatics and what you see in most digital circuits will be an R that is due to a sigma in the material and a C, the capacitor that we have seen. All right, magnetostatics. We normally say that this is a dual field. All right, the magnetostatic field, a lot of people will say that they're not necessarily two separate fields, but they are even in statics, I mean, in general connected. Um, but um, historically we observe them in very low frequencies or um, very low frequencies or zero frequency rather, people observe them separately, even if in reality, what really exists is the, elect the electric charges and the electric currents. This is the real thing. Magnetostatics is an outcome of the electric sources, electrostatic sources. There are no magnetostatic sources 
as you can imagine. There are no magnetostatic charges. They don't exist. A magnetostatic field is created by an electrostatic current, all right, that is um, moving on a closed path. So people will say, well, they're not independent, but it does matter. Here we see them as independent. And what we have defined is the magnetic flux density, which is the magnetic uh, field intensity times a scalar. So always B and H have the same direction, all right? But they differ by the scalar. Then we have seen Ampere's law and we have used Stokes theorem to solve problems. We have also seen that there is a magnetic force if there is a moving charge, this is the moving charge. Then this moving charge, when it is inside the magnetic field that can be that is created by an electrostatic current, then it feels a force. And this force is a magnetostatic force. And this in circuit component form, the equivalent circuit element out of a magnetostatic field is the inductance. And therefore, the inductor is the element. All right. Now, here I would like to uh, also summarize in magnetostatics some of the things that we have done. Um, this is the Biot-Savart law, all right, where I is the current. And um, if there is infinitesimally short current, then we have an infinitesimally small magnetic flux density. And R in this particular case is going to be nothing else. So if you have a, a, a infinitesimally small current density, which is part, of course, of a current, so infinitesimally small current density is nothing else but the current times dl. All right, the current now has the direction, or it could be that 3l has the direction. You will see it either way. So um, what here, what you see as R, if, if I am at this point, then as an observant, then R is this. And that's what you see in the relations. Okay, so then using the Biot-Savart law, we found this relationship for the field that is created by a um, this current, the static current I, and then this one is along the z-axis. So you have to keep that in mind. It's not everywhere is along the z-axis because that's where we can only find along the z-axis we can find a closed form expression. If you move off the z-axis, the expression is more difficult. Now, if you have MATLAB, you can find, you can plot the field everywhere. But um, in a closed form is only along the z-axis. Then using, so we found that you using Biot-Savart law. Then we said that if you have a current that creates cylindrical symmetry, like in here, so the, an infinite long current gives rise to cylindrical symmetry. So whenever you have cylindrical symmetry in the problem, then you can use Ampere's law plus Stokes theorem. And then you can find this relationship here. So if you are, um, if you have an infinite current and you are away from this current by a distance A, then that's the magnetic field that you find. And usually, as we said, the direction of the magnetic field is from the right hand rule. Okay, then we come here. 
there are two expressions that are possible, and I will write both of them here because this book has, it's also this one. Let me call this A1 and this one, which is A2. I believe, let me just make sure that this is A1 and A2 in our book. Just one second. I want to see whether these are Just a second, bear with me for a moment. Okay, here I am. So this is the opposite. So this is um, two, and this is one. Two and one. Okay, so there are two ways. The other formula that the book has is and is instead of a sign, we have design of A1 and you can see why they are related like this. All right, so um, let me, yes, what we have here, so these are the two formulas, either one or the other, the book has the red one. And um, here this shows the right hand rule. So we find now this fu is fundamental for a, um, the field from a short section of a static current because practically it allows us to do different things. Um, I'm not gonna, we have not done this, but the only thing is we talked about magnetic materials. And we have uh, uh, said that the magnetic material is one that has a mu sub bar. But um, we have not done this. So I will put here, don't think that we have to be responsible for that. And we have not done this for now. We have not talked about magnetization. All right. So now what I would like to do with you is to start with this problem. So let me see here. And I will um, put this up in there. So um, let us now consider the following problem that I um, would like you to um, see. And then because it's very interesting in what the outcome from this problem is. And we use Ampere's law. So now we consider the following. We have a perfect electric conductor. So we know that an electric conductor, let me remind you, um, will have, no matter uh, what the conditions are, inside the perfect conductor, under any kind of a field, there are no, um, there are no uh, charges. What does that mean is the following. If the perfect conductor um, is in an area without any field, there are free electrons that they run around, but the total, um, the total um, charge in that conductor is zero because all of the electrons cancel out from the positive holes. Okay, so all of the negative charge, if the electrons leave their nucleus in their atoms, if they leave, 
still because they move around with random motions. Um, eventually the whole result is zero. It's like if you did not have any charges. If there is now an electric field or a magnetic field that is applied externally to this conductor, then what happens is the following. The charges under the impact of the electric field, they move all to the surface of the conductor. And the um, electrons will move towards the direction where there is an external positive charge equivalent. The holes will move on the other side of the conductor. So even under a static electric field, what is inside the conductor is zero. And the only place where there are charges are on the surface. Now, if there is a um, external static source, which is an electric current, and that creates a magnetic field, still there are no charges inside the conductor. All right, so the only place, and in the conductor, even if you, if you have a good conductor and you push inside the conductor an electric uh, uh, current, all of the electrons that will run, all right, because the electric current is made out of electrons that move with a constant velocity, all of these electrons will go to the surface of the conductor. All of these extra electrons that you push inside the conductor, assume that you have a wire, a perfect conductor, which is a wire. And then you have a source, which is a battery. And then this source is pushing electrons inside the conductor, all right, it creates a current. These electrons, they would run, but they will be on the surface of the conductor. They are not going to run throughout the conductor unless it's just a, a material with finite conductivity, like a resistor, for example. But the current that is pushed inside a wire, which is a good conductor, it runs on the surface. So in this particular case, if you have a very a large conductor, but it's a plane, and then you push a current inside this plan, planar conductor, again, the current is going to move to the surface. So you have here like this. This is the conductor. And um, we have now excited on this conductor somehow, a current that flows inside the plane. You see the currents here? They flow to inside the plane down. And um, they are all parallel in this case. That's how we have excited them. And it, they are all running on the surface of the conductor. So inside the conductor, there is a zero field. And then we just have this current. So this current, because it all runs in the same direction and it's a static current, obviously it's gonna create a magnetic field. And this is a surface current, all right? So obviously just to show you how the current would go, um, it would all go like this. If we were to observe it from the top, all right? All of the current will flow like this. So if this is my at z direction here, and the z is x, y, and z, this is the z direction coming out. So that would have been here, the z direction. All right? So the currents are flowing all like this on the surface of the conductor. Now, and you see here, um, they flow uh, opposite to the positive z direction. So now we, from Ampere's law, we have this relationship. So outside of the conductor, which is this area, this is outside of conductor, we have a magnetic field, which is the result 
of this current that flows on the surface of the conductor. And the magnetic field is related to this uh, surface current through Ampere's law. And is equal, the current is along the negative z direction. So that's what you see here. Now we apply Stokes theorem. And from Stokes theorem, we sell, you remember in the Stokes theorem, you have to select a surface. And the surface that we select is this one. We select a surface that in circles that covers part of the current. So, and we select an infinitesimally small surface in this particular case. So the surface is delta S. All right. So in fact, to write from Stokes theorem, we had, if I were to write it here explicitly, I would have delta S infinitesimally small surface of curve of H delta S or I can put it ds rather to be um, ds will be equal to delta s js ds. And if you take and apply Stokes theorem to that, it really gets you from here to this expression, where C is the direction you see the surface goes along the positive Z direction. So the direction of the surface here, I have selected to be along the positive Z direction. And then if I plug in there, I'm getting this result. And I would like you to look at it and try to reproduce it just as you go through this um, analysis. So inside the conductor, obviously, there is no electric, there is no magnetic field, nothing. So the only thing that applies is outside and then if you apply that at the end, you find something very interesting. That if you have, what you find here is the following and I will um, redraw it so you can, if I have this uh, conducting surface, let me try to, sorry, to do it. Do it more carefully. And then on this surface, I run a current <clears throat> that goes like this. It goes inside. And if this is my X, I selected as I did here for this to be the X direction. This to be the Y direction and then coming like out of the board will be the Z direction out of the page. Then this one is along the negative Z direction, the current. <laughs> so then the um, magnetic field, if the current goes inside the board, <clears throat> let me see, if the current goes inside the board, why do I have it minus delta minus uh, I said minus x okay the field then goes so if the current goes inside the board and if you put the right hand rule then outside of the conductor the right hand rule is your thumb has to go along the direction of the current and your other fingers will show you the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the magnetic field according to that 
is the positive x direction. All right, so if I were to use a different color rather. So the direction of the magnetic field here is gonna go like that. And that's what you found from here. All right. Now here, obviously, I will have to put here minus x in that. All right. So the x direction comes to be along the, the and it's equal to j sub s. So is along the positive x direction. So it goes like that, and that's a, and that agrees with the right hand rule. And there is something very interesting also that this is equal to j sub s, and assume that this is a j sub s. J sub s rather is the uh, surface current density. And J sub S will be equal to arms per, well, um, meet it in surface density will be meter square, but here because they all align on one line will be obviously, because it's on the, it, it has to be a surface, but in reality, they are all aligned on one line. So practically you can, um, consider that in this particular case, J sub S it reduces our current reduces to a line current density. which is gonna be A per millimeter or per, per unit length. Unit length rather in the most general case. All right. So this is what you have to keep in mind for this particular case. And it reduces to that because we have defined it to be like only running on the surface and they all run along this direction. So the, the, current, the surface current density, which we call it surface because it runs on this is right, really reduces to a line density, which is amperes per unit length. Do you have any questions about this? This is important to remember this um, here relationship. And I don't think you see when I, can you hear me? Because I don't see this moving for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you, but nothing yeah. has changed on the pad. I know, isn't it? So I uh, let me see whether if I can stop and then do it again. Your certain screen. Mm. I was disconnected. Let me try to connect again for some reason. Okay. Don't know why. Yeah, I see I was disconnected. I have to connect one second. Okay, so that's what I had written down. That the important thing that you need to see is here, and that's gonna be, then we're gonna uh, go to um, the next material on Monday. But the important thing, because that is gonna take us into solenoids. 
Um, the important thing is that when you have a current that flows together on a surface, all right, it, and it distributes along a distance, along an area, then the magnetic field, and if the current distribution is constant, and let's assume that it's infinite for a moment, but very large area. So the magnetic field that is excited uh, because of this current is equal to the current density. That's what you need to remember, that if you have an infinite surface or at least large surface, and there is a uniform current, and all goes in the same direction, obviously, then the magnetic field is equal to the surface density and is constant. That is an important outcome because this is going to take us to the solenoids next. And we're going to then define inductance in solenoids where really that's where the inductance has meaning, all right, when you have multiple turns. Okay, so um, do you have any questions so far about this material? Oh, yes, Professor. So, oh, now you go ahead. Oh, I had a quick one. In that paragraph, you say inside a perfect conductor, there is no current. I thought like a perfect conductor was a wire. Oh, no, if it's a perfect, the, the, if I understand your question, the importance of being a perfect conductor is all of the current flows on the surface. Oh, okay. If the conductor was not perfect, then the current will flow inside the conductor. I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Eduardo. Um, I, I didn't quite understand how you said that the current density JS could be reduced to a line current yes. density? Because um, usually a surface density, I'll show you here an example, is when, let me add the page. Okay. A, a surface density for a current is when the current flows inside, say, sorry, inside a conductor. Let's assume that you have a wire which has finite conductivity, all right? And then the current flows here like this inside. In that case, it's a surface um, current density. And it, all the current will flow like this, for example. All right, all of these are current filaments. In that case, your J sub S will be arms Per, um, per area. So it's going to be, say, meter square, for example. That's a surface current density. Also, connect that. Okay, now. In this, in also, if instead of that you had a, a um, conductor that looked like this and had finite conductivity, all the current would flow inside here. And the, then the density, let's assume that that was like that, and the current will flow inside. And the density would have been exactly Js in amps per meter square. However, in our case, this conductor here becomes perfect conductor. So in a perfect conductor, and let's assume it looks like that for a moment. In a perfect conductor, the current flows on the surface only. So all of the current here is squeezed on the surface. And this then becomes the density for this conductor is a line density and is in amps per meter. And to find the total current, you just have to integrate over a line. That's why it's called line density. So the total current will be J sub S if it's constant times the length of this one. In fact, don't want to do too so many. So the length of this one is this. So to find the total current will be this times the length. 
But for this one, if it flows inside the conductor, and this is the area. It's nine o'clock. So the total current S, the total current, it will be JS times the area. That's what I meant. Uh, professor, for, yeah. for the um, perfect conductor, the third one, doesn't like, doesn't the current flow on all of all of the surfaces? Well, yes. Instead of just yeah, the, that's what the happens top if, one? if it's finite. Yes. If it's finite, you are absolutely correct. It's going to flow like that. All right, it's gonna be all on the surface. So in that case, it would be times the perimeter. All right, now it will be like, if that were to be T, and if that were to be L, as I have it here. That would have been L, and that would have been T. That would be times, times 2L plus 2T. See? Or for something like this, it would flow only on the surface, the current. There. And the total current that will be JS, JL is in S, but in amps per meter. And the total current would have been JS times two pi the radius. Okay. All right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, in uh, in if it's infinite long and you're looking only at the section, like if it is in here, but infinite long, and you're looking only at the, at the, in an area at the point, then in that case you don't see the side and you don't see the one below. That's why it's only here. The the total magnetic field comes out of JS to be equal to JS because this is an infinite long plane. That's why. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Professor, can you reiterate why we made the surface opposite the direction of the current? Because um, which surface? This one surface. Yeah. The, yes. the one for the magnetic field. Uh, we, we, I took the, the surface along the Z direction because I had defined the X, Y, and Z system like this that I have here. You don't have, you know, what happens. You don't necessarily, you're not forced to use it along the Z direction. As long as you, if you use it along the Z direction, then your C has that direction here, you see. You, you get the direction of the path around the area. Say if your area is like this, If that's your delta S, and I consider the direction of this N to be equal to AZ, then for that direction of the surface, the path around it has this direction according to the right hand rule. If I were to take a different, the opposite direction for the surface, then I would have to change the direction of the path. And if I do it carefully, the result would be the same. Okay, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions?
Okay, then I will see you on Monday. And as I said, on Sunday, the homework, the individual homework is going to be to um, check your, to, I, I will return all of your exams. Um, and I will, uh, it will be graded. And then you will have to, um, as a homework, and the homework is going to get like 60 points, as it normally gets, you will have to just do a critique of your uh, work. And I also have to tell you that from previous example, not everybody can critique the work. So don't think because I'm going to give you the exams that it will be graded. And then you're going to have to just say what was wrong, that people do a good job there. So it's not true that everybody's going to get a 60 out of this. You have to work carefully to do that. That's all that I'm going to say. And I will correct also that homework just to make sure. Okay, thank you. And I will uh, see you on Monday, uh, on Sunday rather for office hours. Take care.